so my name is Cassie. Um, just a little bit, the first part of the presentation is real kind of quick and over where I've come since high school. Okay, um, where is the, can you click? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so just a little backstory about me. I did not always want to be in healthcare. I didn't even know what I wanted to do when I was in high school. So when I graduated from Oak Ridge in 2012, I actually went to cosmetology school, thinking that's what I wanted to do. Made it most of the way through and realized that is not at all um, for me. They were too fancy and I wanted more hands-on. So I uh, started working as a CNA at a nursing facility. And after that, I went and worked at a family practice and took some time off, got married, worked with general surgery, and then finally ended up at ENT Group, where I am now for almost six years. And then in the meantime, that's when I actually went to nursing school. Okay. So you were able to do like your LPN stuff like at night? Or? Yes. So wow, that's if, long if you days. Want, click through, I'll tell okay. you oh, all sorry. about it. about that. It's okay. okay. Um, so from 2013 to 2014, I don't know if anybody knows what a CNA is, Certified Nurse Assistant, okay? Um, so what I did was assist the elderly in a nursing facility with daily living. Um, going to the bathroom, taking showers, all that good stuff. Very rewarding. Um, that's actually when I realized the healthcare field was what I wanted to do. Um, I worked there for a year and I kind of got bored with it. <laughs> I was like, okay, I want something else. So that's when I went to family practice, worked in an office. Um, just like as a CNA, so the nursing facility, they actually did classes while I was working. So again, I got worked, I worked and got paid and learned all at the same time while getting my certification. Where was that at? Independence Care Center in Fayetteville. Okay, cool. So um, after that, I went to a somewhere Cape Family Practice. It's now um, EBOMD in Cape. Yeah. That's where I went after that. Again, they did on the job training. Um, I had to take a few tests to become a phlebotomist to do that job. Uh, but otherwise, everything was hands on. I didn't have to go to school to do that. A lot of entry level healthcare jobs now, you don't have to go to school to do it. Um, but they will show you hands-on now. So. Did you do mostly phlebotomy when you worked there? I did a little bit of both. So we did a lot of um, injections, okay. um, chronic health care conditions like diabetes, um, arthritis, stuff like that. And then the phlebotomy I just did on the side when the phlebotomist was out. So I would go in and fill in drawing blood and doing all that in the meantime. So when I got done with that, I decided I wanted to do general surgery. I kind of went everywhere. Um, general surgery, I will say, has been my favorite. I would have stayed. However, when I wanted to go to nursing school, they said, hey, we can't maintain those hours. You can't leave at this time to go to school. So of course I had to leave. But general surgery was awesome. I got to see all kinds of stuff. Um, on here, you know, I got to assist in lots of office procedures. I got to do uh, breast biopsies, um, kind of gross, but hemorrhoid banding, all that stuff. So we got to be right there in it, seeing it go on and everything. And then we also got to do a lot of suture removal, staple removal, and so on. So that was from 2015 to 2018. And then I left again because I couldn't go to school. Well, in the meantime, mind you, I got married in 2015. Surprise, I'm going to be a mom in 2018. So I was supposed to start nursing school in 2017, but surprise, you're pregnant. You're going to have a baby. There's no way I could do a newborn in nursing school and a new job. So I put it off. Um, so I became a mom in January. This is my little. She's six now, but... Um, she was 10 months old when I started nursing school. Um, and then I also started at the KBNT group at that time. So that's when everything kind of changed. And I'm only telling you all this backstory to say, you don't have to know what you're going to do when you graduate. You can explore. I am 30 years old now and I have done all of this. So 
you don't have to know exactly what you're going to do. This was my journey through nursing school. Um, the second year of nursing school was COVID, hence the masks. So that was an exper experiment, uh, experience in itself. Um, we had to learn the world of COVID on top of learning nursing. So um, that's just a little bit about that. And then I graduated from nursing school in 2020. Um, when I graduated, the doctors I work with, I had already been there for two years. They said, hey, we think we need an LPN doing the allergy nurse job. Because at the time, they had a medical assistant. Um, she grandfathered in, done it for several years. But as far as um, policy, protocol, what a nurse can do compared to a medical assistant, it's a big deal. So that's when they said, hey, we want you to do the um, allergy nurse job. She was retiring, so I was going to just step in. So what do I do now? Um, they gave me the nurse job in 2020. Um, basically all day, I see different people. A lot of people are the same people every week because of shots, but I also meet tons of new people coming in for testing. Um, I get to hear about their allergies, their symptoms, and I get to help them in a way of identifying it. I get to test them, um, tell them how to manage it. It doesn't always mean they have to come in and do shots every week just because they have allergies. They can you know, do environmental controls and I get to educate them on that and so on. So that, I mean, it's a lot all in one. You do a lot. Um, is there any questions about what I do? I, it's kind of hard to sum up everything I do. What's, but what's in the shots? Like if someone is allergic, like my wife is allergic to like all the tree stuff. It's the actual tree pollen. So like you inject her with the things that she is allergic <coughs> to. Yes. And she doesn't die. That's it's, what. It's, that's it's the so genius small. of it. Okay. Um, right. So you start when you test. We have this thing. It's called an MQT protocol. Um, so I start. If you want to go to the next screen, it'll kind of show yeah. you. Um, oh, what's important? Oh, you're fine. What's important for my position? What's the things that um, I needed to do in order to do what I do every day? I have to have customer experience because, again, I work with people in the public all day. Some are not the friendliest, but you have to learn to work with people. That's a big one. Um, you have to know the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, going back to that. I am injecting people and testing people for things they could be allergic to. It's just like if you're allergic to a food and you go eat that food, there is a risk that that patient can come um, difficulty breathing, respiratory distress, and we've got to get them immediately administered into epinephrine and O2 and all that. So I have to be able to identify when that is coming on to get it safely stopped. I got, I got a random question. Yeah. So if someone is allergic to like bee stings or peanuts, is there anything that you can do? Yes. Like, yeah, um, really? There is venom immunotherapy. So what they would essentially do is inject the venom into the patient that's allergic to it. I do not do that. That, yeah, um, that seems like... That is St. Louis. Uh, the really hands-on stuff is done by allergists in St. Louis. Immuno immunologists, they have like years and years of experience and training in it. Um, the main reason we don't do um, food or venom is because St. Francis does not have a pediatric ICU. So those are higher risk of, of course, throwing them into anaphylaxis. So if I'm testing a six-year-old and they go into anaphylaxis, we don't have an ICU to get them stable. So it's just not on the table for St. Francis right now. So the thing that, that you're, the allergens that you're dealing with then are ones that are environmental more than, yes. more than like injected or eaten. Correct. Okay. Yeah, we strictly do environmental because of that fact of it's less dangerous. Um, you are exposed to dog hair, tree pollen, grass pollen all day, every day. Um, we've only had in the, well, going on four years, I have been in the allergy area. We've only had one patient go anaphylactic. Um, 
but that is because there was a failure to tell, hey, I have um, swelling of my face when I'm exposed to cats. Well, we test for cats. So that's where the questionnaire and assessment part comes in. If that patient fails to tell us that, we go to test for that. That was the one time. And again, I test two to three a day, so it's very rare. Yeah. Um, I need to know how to administer injections, and then again, IV certification. Um, what I also do, so after I test somebody, I have to look at their test results and decide how are we going to treat them. Of course, I do this with the doctor because I don't have a degree in you know, medical, but I follow their rules and protocols on where I need to go as far as dilution and where to start them at. Um, we don't just start off with a bottle of the pollen inject. We don't do that. We take it, and I have to mix that pollen down six times so it's water, essentially, a little bit. And so what we do is we take a little bit of that and then work the patient up over time, basically building the tolerance until they can get full symptom relief. Um, a few things I've done after my LPN to further myself in allergy, because um, the nursing program doesn't teach you anything about allergy. They kind of skim over it, but it's not a main thing. So I did um, have to obtain my pharmacy certification as well. That's because I'm doing sterile compounding with those medications, mixing the uh, patient vials, the treatment vials, and everything, so I had to do that. I've attended two conferences. Again, I didn't have to pay for any of it. St. Francis says, hey, we want you to go to this, and we went. So um, basic course basically taught me how to do it, um, and all, all about allergy, the basic course. And actually, just this earlier this month, they had us do the um, advanced course, going more into depth on asthma, um, biologics, and stuff like that. So they are continuing to send me to learn more and more and more so that we can be... Um, trusted when when a patient comes to us we say hey we've done all of these things you know we know what we're doing so this is just an example of the allergy prick test what some results would look like um, on a positive so it essentially looks like mosquito bites and we take that result and that's how we mix a vial we go off of how big it is and so on so in a vial you mix all of the things 12 so we test for 37, uh -huh. and we could put 12 in a vial. So I have people with three vials, so three injections once a week, because um, they're allergic to everything. Holy cow. Okay. So this person here had a reaction, because look at these bumps, they had a reaction to all of them? Yes. Oh, wow. Yes, and that's, um, it's actually not as common as you would think. Um, we actually get a lot lately that are all negative. They have the symptoms there, but they're all negative, and then they have to go back to the doctor and figure out what is the problem. Um, this kind of response is actually, I get it maybe twice a week, maybe. And how many of these do you think you do a week? <laughs> 10 to 15, depending on how many days I'm working. What happens after the testing? I kind of went over that all eh, already, but um, I go over treatment options, educating on uh, the risks and everything of it. I have to mix the vial, educate on um, EpiPen, um, administer them. So not just shots is an option. We also do what's called sublingual drops. They are more skewed towards people that are minimally allergic to things because we can only treat for 10 with sublingual drops, but that is an option we do. Um, I basically it's just administered under the tongue and your body absorbs it that way and it's just as effective as shots and the great part is it's not as um, serious as what shots are again that's more towards people that have like five or six allergens rather than 20 to 30 yeah. but yes that is another option we go over how, how long does somebody have to keep like let's say Somebody went in to be treated for the, this allergy that they've got. How, how long is a course of treatment typically? Three to five years. Oh, wow. So it is a big commitment, yes. 
Um, and it is all based on your how severe your um, allergies are. So on average, someone's going to be weekly injections for a year and a half. And then they'll start to taper off um, and become bi-weekly. But again, with um, injecting what you're allergic to, you're going to have some reactions. It's not going to be smooth sailing. You're going to have redness, swelling. Your body's not going to like it. So that's where it may take someone four years, where it could take someone three. It just varies patient to patient. Sometimes I have, um, I have a little lady I'm treating right now. She was two vials. Um, she started having reoccurring symptoms, even on maintenance therapy. And I was like, what is going on? So she saw the doctor. We did a repeat test. She's allergic to different things now. So she has to start over. Um, and that isn't the first time. I've had like two or three do that. They just kind of switch. They aren't allergic to the things we tested first, and now they're allergic to these other things. This may so. be a question that you can't answer. How does that happen? It's natural. It's like natural. Your body's just like, you know what? I hate bees now. Yes, like, and honestly, there is no written study yet, but we are seeing a huge pattern in people with COVID. Um, their bodies just have changed since having COVID and all of, because if you think COVID affected the airway. So now they may not have ever been allergic and now I'm seeing 70 year olds because they can't stop sneezing, congestion and all that. And they're opting to get shots because they're so miserable at 70 years old. So, I mean, COVID, ha I don't, there's no written study to say, hey, yes, there's a link, but there's definitely some, some correlation. And the goal ultimately is that they will no longer be allergic to this thing after being, but like, is there any help to them in the process? Yes. Like, if they get this shot, you know, now, is, is anything going to help? Like, is that going to help them at all now? Yes. Okay. So, um, a lot, there are, I'm not going to say a lot, about a third of my patients, by the time they hit, before they even hit six months, they have noticed some change. They have noticed, oh, I'm going around a cat, and I'm not sneezing, swelling, and all of that. Like, they have noticed. Um, during the process, we always, always want people to be on, you know, Zyrtec, Allegra, Claritin, some kind of antihistamine. Because, again, when you're going around these things, you can't really escape. So there are trees and weeds, grasses. You're going around that. Then you're going to be injected with the pollen as well. you got to think it's kind of double dipping. So we want people to um, take an antihistamine, still use the regular allergy medicine through the process. And usually by the time they hit a year, they can start dropping medicines and see, oh, I actually feel better. Like, there is ways to go through it. It's just you got, your body kind of fights back a lot. Yeah. So. Okay. This is why I love this job. Um, I get to socialize all day. I get to talk to people that I don't know. Um, flexible schedule. I'm the only one in the allergy department. So, I make my schedule. If I don't want to be there, I don't. Only one. Well, yes. No wonder That's why I'm team. so busy. <laughs> That's why I held off on this for yeah. a while. Because I'm like, let me get into a time frame where it's not crazy. <laughs> um, right now, it's not too bad. Allergy season is kind of at a slow um, but yes I am the only one that does all of it so I get to kind of make if I don't want to go to work Friday I don't go to work on Friday it's kind of nice so that's that was a, a deal if because it's very hard to hire for this job people don't understand what it is what you're doing and so not a lot of people apply which means that's just me so when I am um, Talked to my director and supervisor. I was like, if you want me to keep doing it by myself, this is what I want. And they said, okay. So if that's you, why I love it. If in a perfect situation, like let's say some of these kids graduated high school yeah. and they wanted to work with you and for you, what would you like, what kind of training would you like them to have if they were to come in and work for you? Basic, of course, you'll have to have you know CPR, basic life support measures. Um, how to administer an injection, and they would have to know what to do in an anaphylactic episode. Um, 
they are hiring non-certified medical assistants. Whoever would work under me would have to be an LPN or less. An RN cannot work under me, and that's just scope of practice. Gotcha. So if an RN was hired in, then I would then be bumped down, and I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've, so you, done, I've worked my butt off for so this program. Yeah, so, so you're looking, if you were hiring somebody, you'd look for someone with some, some either CNA or some basic uh, basic medical training, yes. things like that. Yes. If if they got hired to do that job alongside you, and you you were you know uh, trying to train them to do this, like would then St. Francis pay? You think for them to get some kind of training beyond that? Or, or? that's the great part. There is no training. I am the trainer. Okay. So like there is nothing besides. Um, they would probably send to the basic course. Um, I got to fly out to Miami, Florida for five days. Nice. And that's what my basic course was. Um, that would probably be something they would do is make them go to that basic course because it does cover everything. But otherwise, everything for allergy is on the job training. You can't go, there's no class to go to for that. You, I mean, it's just not. So all of your certifications basically were just just certifications for jobs that you had or wanted to have, but they yes. weren't necessarily required for you to do what you do, minus Correct. the ones that were related to injections. And right, so the, so the phlebotomy was strictly for family practice. I needed to be able to be um, to do phlebotomy in the instance the main girl was out, so that I had to do that. As far as for allergy, I don't do phlebotomy, so I don't need that. Um, my pharmacy certification, they no longer require it for my position, but I keep it up um, just because it's nice to have. It's a certification under my belt if I wanted to go somewhere else. So, but as far as you ha would, of course, have to have CPR and stuff like that, but there is no other training. Unless you wanted to go get your license in nursing, that's a definite plus because that tells you everything. So actually, what's next? I told you I kind of get bored. So I'm going back to school in June uh, to get my business management degree. Um, I'm starting with my associates because I am the allergy coordinator. With that, I get more pay if I go get my degree. And guess what? St. Francis pays for it. I don't have to pay a dime. They're paying for me to get my um, associates and bachelor's degree. So. Great thing about working for, I don't know about Mercy, I don't know much about Mercy, if they're new, but St. Francis does do tuition reimbursement. Yes, I sign a contract, but I don't plan on going anywhere, so why not let them pay for my college? Okay, so, what does that contract look like? How long do you have to commit to being there if they pay for your school? Um, it is two years for every $5,000 they pay. Okay. My Associate's degree is 13000 so I'm looking at two years with an associate's, and then if I decide to do my bachelor's as well, however long that would be. But as long as I can use that degree within the facility, they will pay for it. So I don't really have to worry a whole lot about that. But yeah, any questions? We're very quiet. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I kind of was all over the place because I, I, I have not been in one section of healthcare. During COVID, I worked on the floor. Um, I worked in the office. I've worked allergy, family. So I've kind of done a little bit of everything. So. How much is your um, annual salary? Ooh, that's <laughs> I mean, it's like. Well, I'll gladly like tell you. Um, so let me tell you when I started. Within from two, ten years, I started at nine seventy five as a CNA. I'm now making twenty one ninety three, within a ten year period. Wow. So that's I mean I don't know if you know much about growth, but that is. So do you? Uh, they do they pay you like based on your certification though too? Yes. So like if you were doing this job as a CNA, you wouldn't be making as much. No, as this I am a licensed nurse, so. Yes, a medical assistant is going to make much less than what I am. 
Um, also, I have been doing it for, well, going on four years. So that's experience is a big thing, and certifications are. Saying you can get a job in it, absolutely, but the pay is what kind of experience do you have and certification. So. Other questions? Don't be shy. I'm not ashamed of telling my pay. I'm very proud to make that much some at people, my age. Some people get offended, that's why we're throwing okay. it out. Usually when the, I, and the question usually does get asked in here, and what they answer is like, in this profession, your ballpark range. That, that's, that's, you know, I was asking. Yeah, no, hey, that's. No, well, I get it. Um, actually, so, before, so with an ENT, when I was a medical assistant, I've only been there six years, okay? I started at $12, and obtaining those certifications, going to these conferences, I'm almost $10 more. Like, if that helps you kind of understand where every time I do more, I get more. So when I go get my bachelor's and my associates, I'm going to get more for that because it's just something that helps in my position. And as a general rule, if you want to figure out what that equates to per year, you kind of multiply it by, what is it, by two, two and then it's in the hundred thousands of that. So then basically if you made $10 an hour, you make about $20,000 a year. But if you make $20 an hour, you make like $40,000 a year. It's a it's, that's a, it's, a, it's a huge jump. Yeah. Yes, I, I did Double do a, a big, fun. big jump. Yeah. The IRS doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, they love it. They just want to take more and more. Oh, yeah, they, they do. So, any other questions? I should require everybody to ask a question. I feel like that would be a good way. I, I didn't warn you, well, maybe people wouldn't show up if I did that. Though. Oh, yeah. We're glad you're here. I don't it's, know how many people not show It's up. not very... Exciting. A lot of people don't know what it is, so. Then why don't you explain how you use an EpiPen? I was actually going to bring one, and I, I have You have yours? You yeah. have your trainer? You know, I have, I think, each one of my old ones I have in here. You probably don't have your trainer, but I can at least show you what they look like, what they do. Um, this is a more compact version. So there's three different types of EpiPens. This is the newer one they came out with besides an OBQ. OBQs are my favorite, but they're so expensive, nobody can get them. Um, but this is a compact version of their original EpiPen. So if you look at it, it's very tiny, easy for her to carry, no issues. What you do is you remove both glue, and it's going to reveal a red end. That red end goes into the thigh, and you have to hold for 10 seconds. The reason is, is this is a pin injector. That red, if you can see on the picture, the red area, <coughs> that's covering a needle. And once you stab yourself in the side of the leg, that needle then is pushed into your skin. And you have to hold until this pin can push all that medication into the body. That's why you have to hold it the 10 seconds. Um, about 20% of people that require an EpiPen for any reason, not just my reason, um, need two before they're actually better. So some people get two in a pack and they're like, oh, I got one for home. I got one for my backpack. No, no. The reason is is because of that. If you need two doses and you only have one, you're going to be struggling to get to the ER. So, and that's another thing. If you have to use an EpiPen for anything, you need to go to the hospital. There's biphasic anaphylaxis. What that would mean is you feel better for a little bit, You've already used both of your EpiPens, and it happens again, and you don't have anything. That's why anytime someone has to use an EpiPen, make sure they go to the ER. Question? Yeah. If most people need two doses before they actually like, feel better, why don't EpiPens have more, like a higher dosage in them, I guess? Um, that's the standard FDA approval. That's, all, that's the only answer I can give you. That is the standard they will approve for a dosage that much for someone to self-administer. If it was any more, would it be unsafe? Yes. you got to think it's adrenaline. So your heart is going to be racing. They don't get, hence they don't just get them out at pharmacies. you got to have a prescription and stuff. It's because it's adrenaline. Um, they just don't give more than that. 
and I guess maybe two if it's little kids. They yes. Wouldn't need yes. As much. So there is different dosages as well. Um, people 66 pounds and under, which is little bitty, they get half of that. So you got to really monitor um, when someone has an EpiPen how much they weigh. And that's why you don't use your EpiPen on somebody else, especially if they're smaller, because you don't know what if they are 64 pounds and then you just administer two doses of their one. Or, yeah, one dose to their two. It's dangerous. So that someone like my size that weighs about too much, uh, would they have like an EpiPen that's like enormous or would I have to use like four of them? It would be that. Um, that is a standard that should make someone feel better. Okay. Yeah. Because by the time you notice you're not breathing or you're swelling, your face is swelling, you're going to administer that and you're already going to be on your way to the ER or calling 911. Yeah. And they will administer more at the hospital. Yeah. In an emergency situation, say somebody like weighs more than you, does it work for the same? Like, I know you said you can't really use it for somebody that weighs less right. than somebody right. weighs yes. more than you and they would need a higher dosage, is it considered more or less safe to use it on them if they weigh more than you? Um, it's not really as far as if they weigh more. So you can say someone, you have an adult EpiPen and your mom goes into anaphylaxis. You can use your EpiPen on her. It's going to do the same effect. They're not going to require more than. I'm just saying like the two together, 0.6 is about as much as someone will need for instant relief enough to get to the ER. They shouldn't need more than that instantly. I, I've never heard of it and there's no study on that. So is that 0.6 milligrams? Total. Yeah. So each okay. pen is 0.3 gotcha. uh, milligrams per ml. So okay. So does Dr. Kins prescribe biologics based on your recommendation then? His recommendation. So I, um, like if you say this, they're allergic to thing. this or this, and you know, they, something that, like, walk me through that process. As far as biologics, you mean like? Like um, something that I would, make that sure. would yeah. I, and I don't know specifically which biologics would like impede the, that allergic response. So they all do, um, not all, let me rephrase that. There's like six of them that affect the inflammation response on the body. Um, okay, so just regular, like, like uh, inflammation, I'm thinking like Humira. Is that one he would prescribe or? No. Not? Okay. The only ones we really have done much with, we are getting into the biologics. We just yeah. started last year. Um, the only ones we do anything with is called Zolaire and Dupixent. I've heard of Dupixent. Dupixent's great, I love it. Zolaire, not so much, but that's but just like, my okay. personal opinion. So, really, uh, allergies have to do with, like, eosinophils mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. Do, do those biologics somehow keep those at bay? It blocks them. Wow. So, they're great. They are great. Um, we only do it for patients with what's called nasal polyposis. Um, and theirs is because they have chronic inflammation that's causing polyps. Um, Does that cause the polyps? To... Yes. Yes, it makes it go away, and it's so amazing. I My love it. That's like why I'm excited, because Dupixin is a great, great drug. I love it. Wow. Um, but Zolaire is also one we use for nasal polyposis. Zolaire um, is more IgE-mediated, so we have to check someone's IgE levels before even prescribing it, because their dose will be dependent on how high their IgE is and their weight. So we have to watch that. Um, Dupixin is not. Dupixin is going to be the same for anybody over 18 years old. It's going to be the same dose for everybody. I'm going to go out on a limb and say thousands of dollars per dose. Yes, <laughs> it is a very expensive drug, as but all you know, I do the prior authorization process on all of those. Um, so it's easy and hard at the same time to get someone approved, but. If you have all the documentation there, it's great. Like nothing, nothing down. So. Do pixels. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Can I go back to work after this? No. <laughs> no. She writes her own schedule. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I do, and that's 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 a great thing. Like I I think I worked one Friday last month because I needed to go mix 
but other than that, I, I really haven't worked Fridays. And that was strictly because I'm the only one doing this, and I was like, if I'm going to be the only one doing this, I'm going to get perks out of this. <laughs> and they agreed. So. So you're able to mix up this stuff, like, well in advance? I do the Friday before. So if someone's coming in on Monday, that Friday they get mixed, and it, that mixture is good for 12 weeks. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, what if they come in on the Friday of the following week? Does that still work? Right. So they need... Ideally, a patient needs 10 out of 12 doses to get to maximum level. Um, so that's where I have that two-week grace period to be able to mix and have it ready for them. So you just keep it like refrigerated, yes. I guess? Okay. Yes. I have a whole fridge full of vials. So there are vials that have, is it cat dander? <laughs> cat dander, dog dander, tree parts. Yes. And, like they're dandruff, like they're... Their skin, so. uh, look, where do you yes. get the dog dandruff from? Though? Like, do you? So I would love to hole. actually go see the process of how they do it. Um, like, is it they, from like a home? Like, is it from like it's a lab? A lab. A lab. We'll, we'll literally sit there and extract and then break down and filtrate everything until it's the raw material and then puts it in a vial. And then, trust me, it is expensive. I see the bill when I order stuff. That is crazy because you like. We're surrounded by dog dander, but it's oh, probably not in the What's thing. even better is we test for what's called cockroach feces, which is cockroach poop. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah. How much do you pay for cockroach poop? $1,700 a vial. I think I got a business out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Kids, I think I figured out a way to hold our t shirts for I next know. year. But you would think, ew, that's so gross. But only because I work in allergy did I do this, not because I was just curious. Cockroach poop looks like pepper, so you would not know if you saw it. <laughs> Kids, don't you get me terrible ideas? Like I'm just saying. To pepper out. <laughs> um, I was curious. I'm like, who who does this? And I'm like, okay, what does it look like? Because I don't know if I've ever seen it. That little tiny, tiny little flex, and so tiny. Um, so the reason we do that, and you're going to understand when I say this, everybody orders on Amazon now. Everybody goes to stores, buys your stuff from the shelf. That stuff's been in the warehouse. That stuff's been in a box truck. All those bugs have been on your cereal boxes, whether you like to think of it or not. <laughs> and their droppings <laughs> are all over your things. I know, it's so gross. <laughs> so if, gross. If you ever want to really get grossed out, look at the maximum number of, of rodent hairs allowed in a macaroni box. I'm serious. <laughs> I think it's like 12. Um, yeah. There is actually a mouse urine one as well that they can test for. We don't because it's very expensive and not worth it to me. So, yeah, you can test for, oh, my gosh, so much things. So much things. What's the weirdest thing that is? Uh, for testing? Yeah. Oh, wow. I, don't, I should have brought a catalog <coughs> and you could have looked through it. There's just. I have the little thing on there that has all the so we test for actually more than that now. Really? Yes. We now we were doing 27 then. We're doing 37 now. Yes. Give us the top 10. Um. I don't like, like, like the reveal. As far as weird. You know, give us a variety pack. Weird so we do common. cattle. So the cattle hair. We do horse. Um, we are looking at doing guinea pig as well. Um. Yes, so there is also um, fire ants. You can test for fire ants. See if someone's allergic to that. Um, yeah, the mouse, the mouse urine and the cockroach feces is probably my least favorite because it's really gross. But I, I bet, yeah. Is the mouse urine come liquid? Yes. Uh, yes, it's all like an oil. It it's like an like, oil base. Does it, it have to be like approved or something? Yes. So it is approved. However. It's very expensive. And the thing, we just see it as what is the patient exposed to most. Um, and that's what we test for. Um, there's something called the Respiratory Panel 8. And that is allergy community for everything in the U.S. is broken out into sections, so regions. Really? We are Region 8. Um, okay. And that's all of Southeast Missouri, um, so some of Arkansas. Some plants that aren't indigenous right, so you're not going to go to Florida and test for um, birch trees. You're going to, because it's just not in Florida, you know. 
So that's where Fine. we go Fine. more region. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we started the cattle and horse just because we, we started to get a lot of farmers. Um, so we started doing cultivated corn, which is the pollen off of the corn fields when they harvest. And then we did the cattle and horse because they're farmers. So. Do you test for ragweed? Yeah. Yep. I guarantee I'm allergic to that. Ragweed and timothy grass are the most common allergies in our area. I actually have, I am allergic to them. I made someone test me one day because I wanted to know. And <laughs> Yes, those are the most common. So, yes. It's kind of off topic of what we were talking about, but I had the question. How many hours a week do you usually end up working? Like, do you have to work a minimum? Of I hours? have to work seventy-two hours, and that's only because I have the insurance. For two weeks. Pay period. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I was like, per week? No. Yeah, I was and like, you take Fridays off? Do what do your days look like? No, 72 <laughs> hours of pay period um, in order to keep my insurance at the nice level price it is. So, okay. I try and do that. Another great thing about my job, again, when I say the flexibility, I can do my hands-on stuff at work and then take my laptop home and I do my paperwork at home on Fridays. I don't get out of my pajamas, and I get to clock in at home and do my work. So I'm still getting paid. It's nice. Do you get bonuses? Do you get bonuses? Um, no. Yet, not yet. Let's. They are talking about taking those back, but. Because um, no. mercy. Because the, the <laughs> of the merger. Because of the merger. Um. Mercy. No, they were talking about giving them back. Uh, but it's a whole political thing. Trust me, you don't want to get into it. Okay. It is. That's just St. Francis in general. Um, they are in the works of forming um, more of a contract with me as far as if you do this many patients a month, you get this type of bonus. If you do kind of like an incentive bonus for me to keep hitting my mark um, on how many patients I get. On average, I see 460 patients a month. So, yeah. Now that's that nice? that's yeah. not just like testing. That's like Correct. if somebody came and got their injections, which would go pretty quick. Oh yeah, it's quick. I usually so you get to know the people. They come in every week. I know their dog's name. I mean, it's that friendly because you just see them all the time. Um, and they literally come in. I say, "How'd you do last week?" If they have any problems, they tell me. Otherwise. I give them their shot, give them a timer, and they sit across the hall. I mean, it's that quick. Probably a five-minute session. I just kind of get them what, out. What's the timer for? They have to stay in the office 20 minutes after an injection. Just in case they have a reaction. Correct. Because okay. um, it's more likely within 30 minutes after an injection. Um, and by the time they get to the waiting room, get done with their timer, see me, and leave, it's been 30 minutes. So. And if it doesn't happen in that time, it's not going to happen usually? You have up to 48 hours. Oh, gosh. Um, it's very rare. I've only, so I do have one other patient. He um, got his allergy shot, and I educate this when people start them, don't do this, but he did it. Um, he got a shot, went home, cleaned out his basement. Oh. Went into anaphylactic shock because he's allergic to molds and dust. And that's what I mean by the, the doubling up. If you're going to do that, that's, that is calling for an emergency. You already had it in the bloodstream. Yes, like, we had just given it. You know what? It. I want lots of it in my wrist. <laughs> I know. When he called me and told me, I said, well, what were you thinking? Like, we go over this. And you don't do that. So that's the probably only the second person I've had actually have to use their EpiPen. So. Any other questions? I have a question for you guys. Does anybody actually know what they want to do when they get done with school? You do? What do you want to do? Uh, between cardiothoracic surgery and neurosurgery. I know a neuro guy, if you ever want to talk to him. He was, my sister-in-law is an RN. She was his RN, and he's super nice. Anybody else? Ac actually, I know a cardio guy, too. I give him shots. So, <laughs> you let me know. Pediatrician? I know one of those. You know, like other level hospitals. I do. I'm very popular. People come to me because, well, 
when I started an allergy, it was still very lax. They weren't very strict on what they were doing. And when I got into allergy and the, the assistant that was doing it retired, I started looking at the policies and procedures. I'm like, oh, that's, that's not very good as far as standard practice. So um, I actually, that's how I got to know everybody. And St. Francis is I started uh, rewriting all the uh, protocols for anaphylaxis because we didn't have one. We didn't have an anaphylaxis protocol if you were not in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. So if you're on an outpatient clinic, they didn't have the medicine if that was to happen. And so that was, it was a problem. Yeah. So I sat down and we started doing it and now we have a protocol in place. All the clinics have medicines and it's good to go. But that's kind of how I know everybody is um, that kind of stuff. On that note, and you, you reminded me of this, I reached out to somebody from St. Francis about getting us into like the robot surgery thing so we can go and visit and see that happen. They connected me with somebody who's like in charge of like their like education department and sent me a link to if you wanted to shadow like any job at St. Francis from, yes. from the maintenance guy to the neurosurgeon and everything in between, they have a page for that. And it's like, they do have at the bottom of the page that uh, you have to click a box that says, I understand that it may take seven to 10 days for somebody to get back with me. So you don't like yeah. keep harassing them. Here's a good thing. But like, they have like this huge list of jobs that you can select that you want to shadow somebody for a day, and they have simplified that process, I'll make that link available to you guys as well. But yeah, St. Francis is I encourage very, it. I encourage shadowing every, anything and everything you think you might wanna do, go. Because hence, I graduated, went to cosmetology school. I did not wanna be a hairstylist at all. And that's kind of what led me to go in everywhere. I didn't know what I wanted to do. It kind of helps you narrow it down because you may get in there and be like, oh, this is not at all what I expected. I have lots of nursing school friends who never completed. You know why? Because they realized how gory it can be. And so I definitely, if you guys can shadow, shadow because it's going to help you a lot. I'll post that link on our Club Med uh, band. And if you're not on the band, talk to Ava. She can get you on the band. So thank you so much for being here today. Thanks. Everybody clap it up. Clap it up. Clap it up.